Okay, this is the third video in section one, and in this one we're going to look at the properties of mixtures. In the previous video, we looked at the properties of substances and found that we could classify them into intensive and extensive properties. Intensive properties are those that are characteristic of a substance and don't depend on how much there is of it. Density and melting or boiling points are all examples of intensive properties. They depend only on the atoms or molecules that make the substance up, not how many of them there are. When you're measuring properties, however, it's important to know the conditions under which you're measuring them, and temperature and pressure are the most important conditions to pay attention to. So although we've said the intensive properties of a pure substance don't change, we have to add the caveat that they don't change as long as you measure them under constant conditions. For instance, the density of a substance can change with temperature and pressure, so if you're quoting the density of a substance, you also need to state the conditions under which the density was measured. And note that if the density changes, the volume of the object is probably changing too. So this also affects extensive properties. For instance, a cup of water ready for tea might have a temperature of 90 degrees C and it's sitting at normal air pressure, which is about one atmosphere. An atmosphere is a unit of pressure. And if we were to measure its density, we'd find it was about 0.972 grams per centimetre cubed. That is, every centimetre cubed of water, or every milliliter if you like, would weigh 0.972 grams. If I now looked at a glass of iced water with a temperature of 4 degrees Celsius straight from the fridge, and also at one atmosphere pressure, I'd find its density was 1 gram per centimetre cubed. The two containers hold the same pure substance, but because they're at different temperatures, their densities are different. This is why it's possible to float hot water on cold water, uh, but the upshot of it all is that if you want to be able to compare the properties of different samples of a substance, you must make the measurements under the same conditions. There's a good reason for all this. All these properties have to do with how the atoms or molecules in the substance interact with each other. And if you heat them up or squish them together with pressure, it changes how they interact. And that means that the properties of the substance change as well. So what about mixtures? This video was supposed to be about the properties of mixtures after all. Okay, uh, extensive properties of mixtures. Since they depend on the amount of material, there's not much of a distinction here. 10 cubic centimetres of pure water has the same volume as 10 cubic centimetres of salty water, which is a mixture. However, with intensive properties, it's a different story. Whereas for a pure substance, the intensive properties are unchanging, as long as you keep those conditions constant the intensive properties of a mixture can change since they depend on what substances make up the mixture and the relative amount of each ingredient that is in the mixture. So let's take salty water as an example. I've got here some data that I pulled off the web um, which shows the concentration of different salty solutions. You can see grams of sodium chloride per 100 grams of solution where the rest of the solution is made up of water and then the density value for each of these solutions. So you can see the first line here um, we've got 0.1 grams of sodium chloride per 100 grams which means that 99.9 .9 grams must be water and the density of that solution is 0.9989 grams per centimeter cubed. Note that uh, centimeter cubed is the same as a mil so density uh, is often quoted in units of gram per grams per centimetre cubed, but that's exactly the same numerically as grams per mil. Okay, and what I'm going to do is graph this data and see if we can see any trends or changes. So we'll use a scatter graph. There we go, and I'm just going to spend a little bit of time tidying this up. There we go. All right, so we've got our graph uh, and you can see that there's an obvious trend that as the concentration of salt in the salt solution increases, so does the density. This illustrates our point that the intensive property of density is not uh, a fixed value 
for a mixture. It really depends on the proportions of the ingredients in the mixture. So here we've got as you uh, increase the proportion of salt, the density also increases. Now this makes sense because the atoms that sodium chloride is made up from, sodium and chlorine, each weigh more than the atoms that water is made up of, oxygen and hydrogen. So sodium and chlorine uh, atoms weigh more and are denser than water molecules. So when you add them to water, if you uh, increase the proportion of salt in the water, then you're making the whole solution denser. So the point here is that uh, the concentration of our mixture determines the density. Um, now if you've got a, a nice predictable relationship like this, then if you know the density of a mixture, you can work out what its concentration is. Uh, and this is a technique that's quite frequently used for determining concentrations, is to, if you know the ingredients of your mixture, you can determine its density, and from that you can work out its concentration. Our world is full of examples of mixtures whose properties we can fine tune by adjusting the composition of the mixture. Usually when we do this we're trying to get the best of both worlds, achieving the best possible compromise between the properties of the ingredients. For instance, we add antifreeze to the water in car radiators to change the freezing and boiling points of the water. And this means the uh, solution in the car radiators can get colder than 0 degrees Celsius and hotter than 100 degrees Celsius without uh, freezing or boiling. In theory we could use pure antifreeze, but the viscosity of this substance is too high to be useful in an engine, and it's more expensive than water. So by using a mixture we get the low viscosity and the low cost of the water, combined with the wider temperature range of the antifreeze. Ganache is the soft, smooth, chocolatey mixture uh, used in many desserts or in chocolate centres. It's made by carefully mixing the right proportion of chocolate with cream. The chocolate gives the flavour, but it's too hard and brittle for soft fillings. The cream tempers the texture of the chocolate and makes it soft and workable. We used to add lead in the form of a compound called tetraethyl lead to petrol to change its combustion properties. This is an example of using a mixture to fine-tune chemical rather than physical properties. The additive raises the temperature at which the petrol ignites, preventing the engine from misfiring or running roughly. When leaded petrol was banned, chemists found other, less toxic chemicals that could be mixed with petrol in order to change the properties in a similar way. Metal alloys are a very common example of mixtures. Since pure gold is extremely soft, it's usually alloyed with, others, with silver or other metals to make it stronger and harder. The carat measurement of gold is an indication of how much gold is in the alloy. Iron is a fantastically useful and relatively cheap metal and is the basis of most modern architecture, along with many other uses. However, in its pure elemental state, iron is too soft for many uses. It can be hardened and strengthened, though, by mixing it with other elements to give the alloy that we call steel. Carbon or silicon are often added. Uh, the steel used for the Harbour Bridge, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, was silicon steel. Steel can also be made resistant to corrosion, which is a chemical property, uh, by adding a small amount of chromium and nickel. And then you have stainless steel. Okay, your task for this video is this. I'd like you to uh, look at this question. I've given you the density of silver and the density of gold. Predict what the density of a silver-gold mixture, an alloy, would be. And then give me a short explanation of why you think your answer to question one is correct.